waiting for one more. It's one of those 7-Eleven songs, seven words 11 times. That's what that is. So, Hey, if you're uh, visiting this morning to Twickenham, welcome. If you're a member, welcome. We're just glad everybody's here. Thanks for coming out to be with us this morning. I hope the Lord has blessed your weekend. I hope that it's been a good one for you. But even if it hasn't, if it's been a hard one, we think there can be a blessing here this morning. So I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. There is a card on the seat in front of you, and you can uh, fill out any changes to your uh, personal information that uh, we need to know about uh, for uh, communication purposes here at the church. If you're visiting today and you would like for us to send you some information, indicate that on the card as well. There's also a place there to put your prayer requests, and we will be praying over those as early as this afternoon. So if you want to write those down, you can put them in the collection plate when they pass a little bit later on this morning. Here's something that I'd, I'd never thought I would hear myself say. Um, but the biggest topic of conversation for the past couple of weeks in Hollywood has been sin. That's just about all they can talk about in Hollywood these days is sin and how they are against it. And that's been in the news, and that's been in, uh, on the headlines and blowing up the internet, and it's just everywhere. They're talking about how awful, 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 awful certain sins are. And there's some, some good news and some bad news there. The good news is maybe they're seeing something that they needed to see for a long time. The bad news is it's been there to be seen for a very long time. Um, in fact, it goes much further back than Hollywood, much further back than America, much further back than anything we can imagine. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. So the first two chapters, things are great. But then by the time you get to chapter 3, Adam and Eve choose their own way, not God's. By the time you get to chapter 4, God tells Cain, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. And then the rest of the story, sin is not just crouching at the door, it's kicking the door in, coming in, and taking over. And that's what the story of Jesus is all about. This morning, we're going to be just really trying to deal real honestly with the reality of sin, not in Hollywood, 
and not in the neighbor across the street's house, but in our own houses, in our own hearts. We all struggle with sin. It is a reality in our world, and we acknowledge that, but there is a greater reality, and that greater reality is the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God available to us who have sinned through Jesus Christ, who did not. I want you to just begin this morning with that kind of thought and that kind of meditation as we think about the tension between the reality of sin and the power of God's grace. There's a beautiful passage in the Psalms where David, a man who struggled with his own failures, put pen to paper in Psalm 51, and he wrote a psalm, a song, about sin and mercy and forgiveness. Lincoln and Janet are going to share a version of that scripture with you right now musically. Let's listen to that as we begin our service. Let's stand as we share the scripture. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my many transgressions and wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from sin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my many transgressions and wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from sin. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready, stands to save you, for condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." Be seated as we take our offering. Sin and its ways grow. All of my heart turns to stone. And I'm left with no strength to arise. How you need to be lifted high. Sin and its ways to pain, left here with hurt and with shame, 
Good morning. Uh, as we prepare our minds for communion, uh, I'd like us to look at some passages in Romans uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Uh, before that, though, Paul is talking to us about that Abraham believed in God in chapter 4, and it was credit to him for righteousness. Then it says in chapter 5, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking about um, Abraham and he was called to, to actually leave his father's house and go to another place. Um, but it says that he believed God. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he believed God. Um, and then also he had to sacrifice his son, and he didn't know how that was going to happen. He was told he was going to be the father of many, uh, a great nation. Uh, but yet he was told uh, to do something. But it just says that he just believed God. He believed God, and that was what gave him his faith. Then when we look at our problems and trials, you know, there are a lot of problems and trials in our world. Um, you know, we've had fires, we've had shootings, uh, and we have our own problems. I know we had some, uh, in our own house, we had serious problems, uh, family issues uh, years ago. And I can say that through the spirit that we have developed endurance because of that. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, even right now, just the past few months, I've had some anxiety uh, some issues that I just don't understand why it's happening, but by the same token, I just believe God. I've learned uh, because of the other things and because of what the scripture says and because of Abraham that even whatever we walk through, we just believe in God. So that's uh, given us hope, and we're thankful for that Holy Spirit. So I'm going to go ahead and pray uh, now as we get ready to take our communion. Lord, we just come to you, and we're so thankful, Lord, for your deliverance of us and for your uh, the great love you've had for us, send in Jesus, uh, Lord, just to make our faith possible, to give us uh, the ability to be made right in your eyes. Father, we know that we go through struggles every day, and Lord, we know all of our friends and families do, as well as those in our world. And Father, we just pray for them, we pray for them to just believe God and uh, trust in him for all that, uh, all that we do. And we're thankful for Jesus and his sacrifice at this time. And Father, help us be mindful of that as we uh, take this bread. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
up in uh, Romans 5 verse 6 when we were utterly helpless Jesus came at just the right time and died for us sinners now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person though someone might be perhaps willing to die for a person who's especially good but Jesus showed his great love for us by sending his son uh, God said showed his great love by sending his son Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful again for the sacrifice uh, of your son for you uh, being willing to do that for us and loving us so much. And then, Lord, for him to be obedient to do that. Thank you for uh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us. And again, Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that uh, you've sent to us, uh, Lord, to teach us to uh, persevere through trials, to persevere through our mistakes, and, Father, just to be right in your sight. And, Lord, we're so thankful that we can have that relationship with you now because of Jesus. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. With my hands and my heart, I surrender again. Oh, devotion, adoration, with my life I will praise. Oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, Oh. 
So a couple of announcements here. We are searching for a new executive and worship minister. <laughs> it's been a good run, buddy. <laughs> no, I do want to point out a couple of things. In that middle panel of our morning newsletter, two things there are just really important. Uh, on November, Friday, November 3rd, we're going to have our annual prayer service. It starts at noon and runs to midnight that night. And we, we really want you to sign up to come and, and pray for an hour in that period, or for 30 minutes, or however long you can do it, uh, sometime between noon and midnight. Um, it is extraordinary to come into this room and see the, the stairs on this stage lined up with prayer cards. And you just grab a handful of them, and you go sit down out here somewhere, or walk around, whatever you want to do, and just lift up those concerns. Uh, last year when Lisa and I came over and, and did this, we were both just in tears uh, about what we were praying about. And it, and it, it, it was, we were kind of hit with how heavy some of it was, but we were hit with also how joyful and glorious some of it was. So it's a, it's a very powerful thing for you to do, and I really want to urge you to put that on your calendar and be a part of that, that weekend. Also, Fill out your prayer cards. You don't, you don't have to put your name on it. Uh, just fill out a prayer card, and, and you can say anything you want to say on that prayer card, and people in this church will be praying about it, and God will hear, and God will answer. So that's coming up November 3rd. And then the very next day on the 4th, this is, uh, this is really neat. We've got an Aging Well Ministry Fair. It's going to run from 8 a.m. to noon, and basically down in the, in the fellowship hall, we're just going to have uh, stations set up with various people who can talk to you about your concerns about aging and talk to you about resources that are available and answer questions that you may have. We'll have some experts in the field here to help you with that. So if you are approaching some, uh, a season in your life where you have some concerns or if you're caring for somebody that is struggling with those concerns, it's a great day for you to come and just be a part of this. I think we're even going to have some teenagers at a table to help you with your cell phone. I think that's actually going to be a thing, so it would be good. So we're in a series right now in the book of Daniel called Even If. Even If comes from a story in, sort of in the middle of the section of the book we're looking at, uh, chapter 3, where three young men are threatened with a, a fiery death if they don't bow down to an idol that King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has built. And, and they, they're, they're polite, but they're very upfront. They just tell him, look, we're not going to bow down to your idol. Our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we are going to be faithful to him. We will not bow down to your idol. And of course, God does deliver them. But it's a, it's a wonderful image. It's a powerful story. So we're in that book this morning, Daniel the book of Daniel, and we're in chapter 5 today. 
You may have heard of the Spanish philosopher, poet, novelist, George Santayana. Even if you haven't, you will know his most famous quote. I'm gonna, in fact, I'm just going to give you the first seven words and you just finish it out loud, okay? Here we go. Those who do not remember the past, apparently some of us don't remember the past. <laughs> oh, you got it. Are destined or doomed or condemned to repeat it. Here's another one that may not be near as familiar, uh, but is just as true. It's from an Uruguayan author named Eduardo uh, Gell uh, Gell Gelliano. And he said, history never really says goodbye. History says, see you later. And my favorite quote about history, though, comes from a, a German philosopher named Friedrich Hegel. He said, the only thing we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. That could actually be the subtitle of the book of Daniel because through the first six chapters of the book, we meet three different kings over a 70-year period who seem to be stuck in an ancient version of the movie Groundhog Day. Things just, the same things just keep being repeated over and over and over. But in Daniel, the day when somebody gets it right never seems to come. So we're, we're in chapter five this morning, and as we're just going to walk through this story. And as we do, I'm going to work in details from non-biblical historical sources, which is really kind of interesting, because the details provided by the non-biblical historical sources uh, provide interesting background to and confirmation of the biblical account. So let me just start with a plot summary of Daniel chapter 5. Here it is. A Babylonian king holds a big banquet with 1,000 of his closest friends. They're celebrating a pantheon of gods when suddenly a supernatural phenomenon uh, puts the brakes on the festivities. The king is mystified. The king is troubled. The king is terrified. He doesn't know what it means. He summons his usual advisors, and none of them can explain what has happened. Finally, somebody says, hey, let's call Daniel. And so Daniel comes in. Daniel interprets the dream. Daniel, it's bad news for the king, and Daniel is given a great reward for his wisdom. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because that's the basic plot summary of Daniel chapter 2 and of Daniel chapter 4, and now again in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel is kind of like the song that, this is the song that will never end. Remember that song when you were a kid, right? Some of you will remember 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Daniel is like that, all right? It just keeps going on over and over and over. The more things change, the more they stay the same, which is probably why we should pay attention to history. So let's go back. I don't know what you were doing Friday, but this past Friday, I was celebrating the 2,556th anniversary of the fall of Babylon. On October 13th, 539 B.C., a Persian named Cyrus, they called him Cyrus the Great, uh, conquered the scientific and cultural center of the ancient world, Babylon. And, and according to a number of accounts, how he did it is really interesting because the city, Babylon, was virtually impregnable. Its walls were said to be four stories tall and so wide they held the 6th century B.C. version of Talladega on the walls. They had chariot races on the walls. So if you went off the rails, you fell 40 feet to your death. Actually, you fell 40 feet into an enormous moat that snaked its way around the city. Cyrus had successfully conquered all of the surrounding region, but, but when he got up to the great fortress of Babylon, he stalled. And the powers that were in Babylon had known that he was coming because you can't really hide the fact that you've got a massive army marching toward you. And so they stockpiled uncountable provisions for what they anticipated would be a very long but ultimately unsuccessful siege. You know what a siege was, right? A siege, you had a fortress, and the siege was the, the invading army would come and just surround you and then just camp. They'd just camp and wait until you ran out of food and water. And when you ran out of food and water, you'd come out. So Cyrus lays the city to siege, 
But they're not worried because they've got all this food and one of the greatest vulnerabilities for a city under siege is running out of water, but that's not an issue for Babylon because the Euphrates River flowed right through the middle of it, providing all the water and all the fish they would ever need. And they had iron, iron grates, iron grates that were submerged beneath the wall into the water so that nobody could swim in. So they were, they were solid. Cyrus is stuck, which is probably why According to Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar, the king, felt confident enough to host a grand banquet for a thousand of his nobles. Now, here's, here's Daniel's description of it in Daniel chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. Okay, we move, kind of move out of secular history into biblical history. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar his father. When it says his father there, that doesn't mean his dad. That means an ancestor. Nebuchadnezzar was a couple of generations back from Belshazzar. He was a predecessor of his several decades back. Um, and he had conquered Jerusalem. And when he did, he took some of the, 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 the golden cups, the dishes out of the temple of God as a way of saying, my God's bigger than your God. Okay, so Belshazzar orders that the silver uh, goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple be brought in so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. And as they drank from them, it says in verse 4, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron wood and stone. And why not? It was iron and wood and stone that were the very things that were keeping Cyrus safely outside the walls. That and some good planning on Belshazzar's part. You should know that for a very long time, hundreds of years, that critics of the Bible thought that this Belshazzar character here in Daniel chapter 5 was a fiction. They thought Daniel made him up because his name did not appear in any of the Babylonian records and they were pretty thorough and pretty complete. Nebuchadnezzar, whom we've been following since chapter one, was the first and greatest Babylonian king. He was succeeded by his son, Amel Marduk. He was assassinated probably by a guy named Nereglesar. Nereglesar was succeeded by his son, Labishai Marduk. And he was executed by a man named Nabonidus, who for hundreds of years was thought to be the last Babylonian king of record. And so the consensus was that the Bible had gotten this one wrong. And then some cuneiform tablets were discovered and translated, and we learned that Belshazzar really was an historical figure. Turns out that Nabonidus was Belshazzar's father. And that Nabonidus spent a decade away from Babylon, out of the city, at a place called Tiamon. Tiamon was an oasis. It was kind of like an ancient version of Burning Man or Bonnaroo, except it was a celebration of a moon god the Babylonians called Sin, S-I-N. I'm not kidding. That was the name of their god, Sin the moon god. So while Nabonidus was, was down at Tiamon getting his moon worship on, Belshazzar was installed as the co-regent in the capital city. So the Bible was right all along. So Cyrus the Great is stuck outside the city. Belshazzar is celebrating, and he's celebrating with the dishes his ancestor Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple of God when he sacked Jerusalem. Now, three important things just here. First of all, secular history says that Cyrus attacked Babylon during a religious festival, which is exactly what Daniel 5 says is going on. They're having a religious festival. They're celebrating to the gods of wood and iron and gold and stone and silver. That's exactly what the Bible, so secular history and scripture agree with that. Second of all, Belshazzar knew the history behind those dishes that he ordered be brought in for them to celebrate with, the, 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 the golden goblets. He knew that they were from the temple, the temple of the God of the Jews. He had heard the stories about his 
predecessor had decades earlier, before he was even born, conquered an obstinate Jewish nation and taken those treasures from the temple, and he knew what that meant. That was Nebuchadnezzar's way of saying, our God wins. And then third, by ordering his servants to bring those goblets to his party and using them to essentially hold a communion service to the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone, he was doubling down on his predecessor's sin. He was using the things of God for the purposes of propaganda. Nebuchadnezzar and all his successors had apparently considered those objects too sacred to spoil, but Belshazzar didn't have those qualms. Which makes you wonder, if he knew the history of those temple dishes, surely he had heard all of the other stories about his ancestor Nebuchadnezzar, about his troubling dreams and their interpretations, about the 90-foot-tall idol that he had built and the fiery furnace and the three young men who had survived it and the fourth who shined like a son of the gods in the middle of the fire. And surely he had heard about the season of insanity when Nebuchadnezzar had been dri driven out of the palace and out of his mind and lived out in the woods like Bigfoot or an orangutan or a mixture of the two until he acknowledged that the most high God of the Hebrews, that the God of the Hebrews was the most high sovereign over the kingdoms of people and that he gave those kingdoms to whomever he wished and that he did as he pleased and that no one could hold back his hand. Surely Belshazzar had heard all of those stories. Maybe Hegel was right. It's not a failure to know history that condemns us to repeat it. It's a failure to learn from history that condemns us to repeat it. So Cyrus is trying to figure a way into the city, and Belshazzar is about to learn an unforgettable lesson as he drinks from God's golden goblets. And this lesson that he's going to learn is so memorable that to this day, phrases from this 2,500-year-old event pepper our language, phrases and concepts. Have you ever heard somebody say, I saw the writing on the wall? Or, his days are numbered. I heard that on ESPN yesterday talking about a particular SEC football coach. <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody describe a politician as a lightweight? All of those phrases and ideas come from this story. While they're celebrating with God's goblets, a, a disembodied hand, this is perfect for October, isn't it? A disembodied hand appeared and began to write on the white gypsum walls. Verse 5 says that, oh, I just noticed this, this the week. I never noticed this before. Verse 5 says the hand wrote near the lampstand. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because that way everybody can see. Verse 6 says Belshazzar's face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. That last part, weak legs, knocking knees, that's a Hebrew idiom. Doesn't really mean that his knees were knocking. It means that he lost control of his bodily functions due to excessive fear. He had to change clothes. Just like his forefather. He calls for the pagan advisors who once again offer no help whatsoever. Moments earlier, the room was buzzing with the sound of clinking glasses and the sloppy celebration of people who've had too much to drink, and now it's buzzing with fear and confusion. And the change in tone was so obvious and so dramatic that the queen mother herself comes into the party to see what's going on. And then she gives Belshazzar... A history lesson. Don't you remember Daniel? Your ancestor, the king, the king, I say, Nebuchadnezzar, 
turned to him over and over and over again when he was confounded and terrified and afraid and confused. Daniel has a keen mind. He has keen understanding. The spirit of the gods lives in him. And so Daniel is called, finally. The conversation between king, the, the king and Daniel is worth reading because there's a, a definite shift in tone, um, that, 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 uh, in the tone that Daniel takes with King Nebuchadnezzar, I mean with King Belshazzar, because back when he used to, to talk with Nebuchadnezzar, you kind of got the impression that Daniel actually kind of liked the guy. He was def- very deferential and very polite and, and even respectful to the king. He had the sense that he, that he wished the best for the man who had conquered his country, but you don't get that impression now. Let's uh, pick it up in Matthew, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 5, verse 14. Belshazzar says to Daniel, I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, that you have inside intelligence and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have, now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom, second behind Nabonidus, and then me, and then it'll be you, Daniel. Here's Daniel's response. You may keep your gifts to yourself and give your rewards to somebody else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. You know what? Keep your stuff. Not interested. Don't want it. But I'll tell you what it means. Here's what it means, verses 26 through 28. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Your days are numbered. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. You're a lightweight. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. It's over for Belshazzar. It's over. Verse 29, though, is kind of weird. It's an odd little verse here because the the king's response doesn't seem to make sense. If somebody just told me that it was over for me, I don't think I would do what Belshazzar did. Because here's what happens. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple and a gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. What's going on with that? Here's my guess. When Daniel interprets the dream, interprets the writing on the wall, and mentions the Medes and the Persians, I think the whole room grew deathly quiet, absolutely silent, as quiet as this room is right now. Could have heard a, could have heard a pin drop. And then the king, Belshazzar, just starts laughing. <laughs> you crazy old Jew. That's a great one. That's hilarious. And when the king starts laughing, everybody else starts laughing because Daniel, the crazy old Hebrew, has made a funny joke. He's talked about the Persians and the Medes coming in, and everybody knows that Cyrus is never going to find a way into the city. So Belshazzar, but Belshazzar just says, you know what? That was so funny. Let's put a purple robe on this man's back. And let's give him a gold chain. And so he clothes Daniel in the royal colors, and he hangs the chain around his neck, and he proclaims him the third highest ruler in the kingdom, just behind his father and himself, not as a reward, but as ridicule. Does that sound familiar? Does that remind you of another story somewhere? Another wise prophet being clothed in purple? Daniel's dismissed. The party resumes. And Cyrus, non-biblical sources tell us that Cyrus had not only remembered history, he had learned from it. I want to be real clear, this part is not from scripture, it's from extra biblical history, but here's what happened. The queen mother who reminded Belshazzar about Daniel was named Nitocris. N-I-T-O-C-R-I-S, Nitocris. She had sensed the growing threat of the Medo-Persian Empire and had overseen the construction of massive defensive positions around the city. 
Since the Euphrates River cut right through the middle of the city, she recognized a need to build a bridge connecting the two banks. That way, if you needed to move soldiers and material from one side of the city to the other to shore up a weak part of the wall, it could be done easily. But in order to do that, you had to find some way to divert the Euphrates River long enough to, to, to put the pilings down. So she had engineers dig an enormous basin next to the river north of Babylon. And once the basin was dug, the engineers cut canals to divert the river into the basin, creating a huge temporary lake. And then back in the city, they were able to seat the pilings in the dried up riverbed and build the bridge. And when the bridge was completed, the river was dirted, uh, diverted back to its natural channel and Babylon was once again impenetrable and the infrastructure was better than it had ever been. The only problem with that was that Cyrus had heard all about this colossal feat of engineering. So he sent his own combat engineers to divert the river into a conveniently located basin while the Persian equivalent of SEAL Team 6 waited by the wall where the river ran into the city, and when the river stopped running, they walked under the wall and under the grates and took the objective. Daniel chapter 6, verse 30 says, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Darius was Cyrus's right-hand man. Cyrus installed Darius to be the governor of Babylon. Daniel chapter 5 is a history lesson about how some people do not learn from history. Like Belshazzar, some people hear the stories. They get a front row seat to witness how certain decisions lead to certain results, how outcomes follow actions, how effects follow cause, and they think that can never happen to me. I am exempted from the law of consequences. I'm immune to the side effects of sin. I can handle the hangover. I can walk the same path those poor slobs walked, but I will reach a different destination. And we never do. We never do. Galatians 6, Paul put it bluntly, do not be deceived God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will, will reap eternal life. In Numbers chapter 32, Moses told the tribesmen of Reuben and Gad, be sure your sins will find you out. In the very first psalm, the psalmist warned, the way of the wicked leads to destruction. That's the way it works. Now we talk a lot more about grace and we talk about sin here at Twickenham, as we should. But if you are living your life in an it-can't-happen-to-me kind of way, please, just please, it can happen to you. It will happen to you. It always happens when we pursue sin. I'll tell you something else that can happen to you. The, 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 the repercussions of sin can happen, but so can the rescue of grace. See, some folks think the aftershocks of, sh of sin will never shake them, never, never shake their lives. They think, it can't happen to me. And then there are those who are living with the fallout, who are living with the aftermath, the blowback, and some of them, maybe some of us, maybe you think, it can't happen to me. Grace can't happen to me. I have wandered too far. I have waited too long. I have wounded too many people. I have become so identified with my sin that it has practically become my name. When people think of me, they think of my sin. Me and my sin are the same. I stand in front of you today as testimony that grace can happen to you. Grace will happen to you. Sin is strong. Grace is stronger. You may feel like sin and consequences 
have your number so much that they have become your name. I want you to listen to the song that we're about to sing. Because this song encapsulates some of the most precious promises of Scripture. God can change you. And God can change your name. Let's stand, let's sing together. I will change your name. You shall no longer be called. step out into this week, we will be tempted to worship the gods of gold and silver and iron and wood. Preserve us in those moments, God, for you are our refuge. Let us know, Father, that we have no good apart from you. It is you who make known to us the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. And At your right hand, God, our pleasures forevermore. Do this for us, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.